Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our online conversation, Four Essentials of Estate Planning, How You Can Gain Peace of Mind. I'm Kimberly Mueller, Development Manager at the San Diego Public Library Foundation, and I'll be your host today. I'm excited about our talk with Nancy Spector, who I'll be introducing shortly. We're seeing a lot of positive energy around our estate planning webinar series. It's really resonating right now. People are looking for estate planning education to make informed decisions and looking for a trusted guide. The Library Foundation is a resource in their estate planning process. First, a little housekeeping. We will be recording this talk and we'll make it available to you. I encourage your comments in the chat box. There's an ask a question field below just for questions for our speaker. We will have a Q&A toward the end of the program. Keep an eye on the chat as we'll also be providing valuable links. Clicking on the button below will take you to the Library Foundation's planned giving webpage. Please do visit it and read the stories of donors who are using their estates to make an impact in the community. If any of you have made a planned gift to the Library Foundation, thank you from my heart. We encourage you to advise us of your intention so we can honor your wishes. We invite you to join our Carnegie Society so we can thank you and you can be part of this community of supporters. We have the link in the chat. And please type hi in the chat if you are a member of the Carnegie Society. We've created a handy planned giving guide for simple ways to make a gift and a lasting impact in your community. There's a link for it in the chat. You can click on it right now and we'll also be emailing it to you. I talk with library foundation donors every day. And when I ask them what inspires them to give, they talk about how important the library was to them as a child and still is. They talk about reading books and using the technology. They talk about free access for all and education and equity. They tell me about what matters to them and what they want to see live on. Now, before we begin, I'd love for you to hear from Patrick Stewart, CEO of the Library Foundation. Patrick? Kimberly, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Patrick Stewart and I serve as the CEO of the Library Foundation. And I do wanna say that we are all so grateful for all the support from each of the organizations that we recognized at the start of this program. I'd also like to recognize and thank the current and former trustees of the foundation. If you are a current or a former trustee with us this afternoon, please say a quick hi in the chat so that we can all recognize you. And again, on behalf of the foundation's board, staff and volunteers, welcome to this afternoon's webinar. We're really glad to have you join us. The Library Foundation plays an important role in serving San Diego in that our mission is to strengthen our communities by supporting excellence in the San Diego Public Library system through philanthropy, advocacy, and outreach. The Library Foundation is a catalyst for creating stronger communities through investment in the San Diego Public Library system where access to resources supporting literacy, workforce readiness, and lifelong learning ensure equal opportunities for success. We do this through building lasting relationships with our philanthropic and corporate communities, through ensuring that our elected officials prioritize the value that the library has in every San Diego community, and in creating effective channels that convey that impact. The Library Foundation ensures that our library system has the tools and the resources it needs to fulfill its vision every single day. But now, more than ever, we see that access to that vision may be especially prohibitive for many families in San Diego. As our library continues to provide innovative means of creating and delivering essential programs and resources, the Library Foundation, with the help of supporters just like you, has made access to these resources our highest priority. Providing computers to students participating in the popular Library Next program, ensuring that participants in the library's Read San Diego and Career Online High School programs have the tools to continue their learning uninterrupted. And by bringing laptops to the courtyards and outdoor spaces of our neighborhood branches so that those individuals who rely on the library to stay connected to the world around us are able to do so. These are just a few examples of the foundation support for the work of our library system. Support that wouldn't be possible without you. 
This year, in partnership with the library, the foundation is supporting the very important work of the development of a new library master plan. Designed to build on the innovative and forward-thinking work of the library system, a new master plan will more accurately take into account library usage on a community-by-community -community basis. It's on pace with city growth and will ensure that the library is able to deliver its programs both on-site as well as incorporate cutting-edge technology and is able to meet community needs in a proactive and impactful manner. Part of the development of this phase of the master plan requires your input. Through April 17th, the community survey is available on our site, supportmylibrary.org slash master plan. The survey is thorough and includes questions about library usage, what really works for your library experience, where barriers may exist, gains community insight, and ask questions about technology. If you've not had a chance to contribute your voice to this important project, I encourage you to do so. Your voice is also vital in ensuring that the library has the public funding it needs, especially as it plays a very important role in San Diego's recovery post-pandemic. The City of San Diego is currently contemplating its budget for the next fiscal year, and our advocacy efforts are needed now more than ever. I encourage you to visit our advocacy site, libraries-transform-sd.org, to learn more about our advocacy efforts in conjunction with the Friends of the San Diego Public Library and the Library Commission, and how you can get involved. We need to make sure that our elected officials know how important the library is to our community, and you can add your voice to this very important call. Again, thank you. Thank you for your support of our library, the Library Foundation, and thank you for your interest today in how your support for the causes you value most can be provided for for years to come. With that, I'll turn to Kimberly so we can get started. Thank you, Patrick. Before we move on with our program, it is my honor to recognize Gracia Molina de Pic, who generously included the Library Foundation in her estate plans to benefit the library. Gracia was an educator, feminist, social activist, mentor, and philanthropist. She dedicated herself to a life of service. She believed that your individual life only has meaning if you unselfishly engage in the fight for equality, justice, and peace. She had the drive and the opportunity to advance women, particularly poor, migrant, and indigenous women. She received many Lifetime Achievement Awards. Gracia was an avid reader. She frequently patronized the library and borrowed books and audiovisual materials for herself and to share with others. She saw the San Diego Public Library, particularly the Logan Heights branch, as a place where people could go to empower themselves and improve their lives. Gracia's life was about impact. Her estate gift was about impact. By including the Library Foundation in her estate plans, she helped the library continue to be a vital place of free access, equity, and lifelong learning. Gracia's spirit will live on across San Diego. People want their estate plans to reflect their values. They want peace of mind. They want to make it easy on their loved ones. Estate planners are seeing a dramatic increase in business right now. People are wanting to create and update their estate plans to ensure that they reflect their current intent to cover incapacity, the distribution of their estate, and tax liability. And they want to make an impact in the community. It is my true pleasure to introduce you to our speaker, Nancy Spector, who will be covering essential estate planning documents and so much more. Nancy is a certified specialist in estate planning, trust, and probate law and a former trustee of the Library Foundation. We have a link to Nancy's bio in the chat. And a reminder to please put your questions for Nancy in the question box. Nancy, I know you do excellent work for your clients and we so appreciate your expertise here today. We are honored to have you. Please take it away. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kimberly, Patrick, and Natalie for inviting me to speak today at the Library Foundation. Um, this are, these are different times. Uh, all the times I've been, all the years that I've been an estate planning attorney, people have come to me when they've been diagnosed 
with something or somebody's died in the family or maybe or, or or a friend or maybe they're leaving for india next week so they come to me and they say oh my gosh i have to update my documents or even have documents well this changed a lot in the last year so along with doing jigsaw puzzles baking bread cleaning out closets they said oh maybe i should look at my estate planning documents so we've been busy. I mean, I know other businesses haven't been, but we have been busy. And so what I'm trying to do today is really go through some of the issues that you should be thinking about. Uh, one of the questions that you should ask yourself is, do you even know where your estate planning documents are located? Sounds very simple, but maybe you don't know. Maybe they're in a safe deposit box. Maybe they're in a, your desk drawer. I, I don't know. Have you told anybody where the documents are located? Um, do you know what those documents provide? Do you understand the documents? Uh, you know, do those provisions in the documents reflect your intent today? That's what I care about. And Kimberly touched on that when she talked just now. What has changed since you signed those documents? I have clients who signed them in 1999 or 10 years ago or whenever, and their lives have changed a lot. They have new children, new grandchildren. They care about different charities maybe that, that they provided for. Um, maybe they've inherited money uh, from their parents, or maybe they've gotten married since they did this document, their, since they did their documents. Maybe their children are old enough to be the fiduciaries, the executors, trustees, agents under the power of attorney where they had their brother or their sister or somebody else. And so uh, certainly the tax laws have changed. So I'm going to try to hit on the major issues today that I think you should think about. Another consideration is you got to find the right professionals, your attorney, your accountant, your financial advisor. You have to trust that person. You have to understand that person. If that person talks to you in language that you really don't understand, then get rid of that person and move on. So, um, and the financial advisor the same way. If you're not happy, you're the consumer. You have a right to change, so do it. And so why we're talking about this, um, I think it's really important. Uh, I love libraries, I should say that. And I think libraries do change lives. So yes, I'm a past trustee of the Library Foundation, and I'm proud to say that. And also, I'm a legacy giver and uh, part of the Carnegie Society. So let's go to the documents that they advertised. Uh, the four essential assets, I'm sorry, the four essential documents that I think everybody should have, at least in California. Um, and as John Lewis said, keep your eye on, on the prize. So the prize is making it simple for your loved ones, getting things organized. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the trust, then the will, then a financial power of attorney, and the advanced health care directives. Yes, there are other documents, but these are the key ones that I think we should look at today. Why do people in California have a trust? Good question. In other states, it's not a big deal. But in California, the first reason that people would say is they don't want to go through probate. Well, what is probate? Probate is the process, the court process, where somebody dies and they say, I want my estate, maybe it's 100,000, maybe it's 100 million dollars. I want my estate to go to these people or these charities. If you do a simple will or you handwrite a will, it's gonna go through probate. If you have more than $166,250. Now, that's a weird amount. It, for years and years and years, it used to be 150,000. So if you had less than that, you didn't have to worry about probate. If you had more than that, you did have to worry. So let's look at our first chart for the probate. Um, and this shows you that in the various, I don't know, it's very small. Is it bigger for you? I don't know. There it is. Great. Okay. So if you look at this chart, if you have a home and it's worth $500,000, you can see that the probate fees would be 13000 and where does that go? It goes to the attorney, it goes to the executor. It's based on the value of the assets. 
and note that it's the fair market value of the property. So if your house um, is 500,000, but you owe 400,000 on it, you still, those fees are based on the 500,000. And then you add up your bank accounts, you add up your investments, whatever. So probate can be quite expensive. Um, but many people are under the misconception that it goes to the state. It doesn't. Like I said, it goes to the attorney and it goes to the executor. And most people say to me, I don't want Nancy Spector as the attorney earning that kind of money off of my estate. Why would I? Um, so a trust is a way to avoid um, having a probate. If you put the assets into the trust, what does not count for your assets in your own name would be anything with a beneficiary designation. That would be retirement accounts, uh, annuities, insurance. And that's one of the topics I want to talk to you about is the importance of beneficiary designations. Going back to the trust, it should reflect your intent. And I always think of it sort of like a, a play or a book. First chapter, second chapter, third chapter, or act one, act two, act three. So let's play it out. You're married. Um, maybe you're married, maybe you're not. But if you're married, let's say both of you are alive, everything's fine. And then one of you becomes incapacitated. What happens? That's chapter two. Chapter three might be, um, might be one of you dies. Chapter four might be after the death of both of you, or if you're a single person after your, your death. So you walk through this and the trust should reflect each part of this, the incapacity, um, the death, and what you want to happen at different stages of this. If you're married, consider the issue of community property versus separate property. Maybe you brought money to the marriage or a business or a home or investments. Maybe you got married later in life. Maybe you inherited money from Aunt Sally and you want your children to get that money. And maybe you're providing somewhat for your spouse, but maybe your spouse has pension, a military pension or something like that, that the spouse will be just fine. And you want your kids to get it right if you marry, if you die first. So one of the big issues is community property versus separate property. Uh, I have some clients who have literally three trusts one for the husband's separate property, one for the wife's separate property, and one for their community property. Maybe they own a home together. And so that's been a really important issue that you need to discuss with, with your spouse. If you're single, check out this diagram. Um, note that the, that the assets with beneficiary designations are in that circle. See the circle up there where it says retirement accounts, life insurance, annuities, and you have a trust and then you say, okay, this shows three children and maybe two grandchildren. But you see that during lifetime, you have the trust, you have total control. What happens after death, it becomes irrevocable. All right. And so look at that and think about what your assets are, which would go by beneficiary designations and which should be funded in your trust. And one of the other misconceptions is that your retirement accounts go through your trust. They don't. They go by way of whoever is designated as your beneficiaries on those assets. And sometimes those assets are bigger than what's in the trust. I have people who have millions of dollars in their retirement accounts and they own a home that's the only asset really in the trust. So you have to think carefully about your planning, who gets what and when. If you're married, please look at the next diagram which shows a very simple trust. This is the, probably the most, the easiest, simplest way. Everything literally goes to the surviving spouse. So there are advantages and there are disadvantages to this one. You'll note that there is a disclaimer trust that's in there just in case the laws change and we need it um, for either creditor protection or uh, usually it's for, to, because the tax laws change. We rarely use that disclaimer trust, but it's there if we need it. So showing this kind of trust, which as I said, is the simplest one, makes it very simple for the surviving spouse. And there are tax advantages because we get what's called a step up in basis at the first death on the assets you have. Maybe you had a home in La Jolla and you bought it for $50,000 and now it's worth 2 million. And by the time the surviving spouse dies, maybe it's worth $3 million. Well, the children or the 
whoever it is would get it at that value, um, the, the tax basis would go up to the death of the second spouse. Um, but let me tell you the risk. The risk is that the surviving spouse could change it all. They could change all the retirement accounts, the life insurance, the annuities, if, if the spouse is named as the beneficiary, and also change everything about the surviving, um, the trust, what's in the trust. So do I think it's a good idea? Well, it depends upon the situation. If it's a second marriage with different children, not a good idea. Because think about it, the surviving spouse could say, I never liked those kids. I'm, I, I don't want to get leave them anything. So I'm going to only leave it, to, leave it to my children. I mean, this happens all the time. If you're married for 50 years and you have the same children, yeah, why not? Why not make it simple for everybody? The next chart shows this federal estate tax exemption. When I first started, the exemption was $600,000 a person. That meant when you died, you could have 600,000 to leave to anybody. If you were married, you have 1.2 million. And you'll note that it was $5 million on this chart in 2011. This is just, just showing the last 10 years. Now we have 11,700,000, which means that you can leave that amount of money per person when you die or give it during lifetime. You'll see there's a column for estate tax exemption. There's a column for gift tax exemption. So you decide you want to help one of your kids, give them a hundred thousand dollars for down payment. It comes off of your 11,700,000, but most of my clients aren't worried about it because if they're married, they have, you know, virtually $23 million to give away at death. If you're giving to charity, it's not an issue because you're not going to have a state tax. If you give more than the 11,700,000, then your estate will be taxed. But that doesn't come up very, very often, to be honest. Okay, let's talk about the real questions of having a trust. Who should be the successor trustee? Major issue. Put that underline it, okay? Major issue. Who should be the successor trustee? The old way of doing it would say, okay, I have three kids and my oldest son is going to be the trustee. Who knows why? Okay, maybe that person isn't the right person. Maybe that person doesn't really isn't very responsible. Maybe it should, your, it should be your youngest daughter. What if that person doesn't get along with the siblings? What if that person that you whom you named actually has gone through bankruptcy and is not financially responsible? Not a good idea. What if your children don't talk to each other? Not a good idea to name one of your children. So, and maybe you don't have any children. Maybe you want to name a niece or a nephew or a friend. Um, just as a side note, by the way, if you are named as a trustee, you don't have to act. Maybe you're named 20 years ago in somebody's trust and you say, yeah, I told my uncle I would do it. But you know what? He has environmental issues uh, on one of his properties or the children don't get along or whatever. You can decline to act. So think about that. What are your options for a successor trustee? If you don't have responsible, trustworthy children who get along, which believe me, I have I deal with many dysfunctional families, who should you name? How do you name how do you pick somebody? It could be a professional fiduciary, and I have a list of them. If you want to contact me, I'll be happy to send it to you, uh, who are experienced and they're certified um, by the state of California. I work with them all the time and I have to say I trust them. Or you could have a corporate trustee, um, like a bank, a trust company. I have one client named Ed who said he really doesn't want his kids getting his nine properties during, during after his death and his wife's death. He doesn't want his kids getting the money. Yeah, I'm sorry, getting the properties. He wants his grandchildren to eventually get the properties. He wants the income to go to his children. So that could be 40 years. Well, that's why we're looking into corporate fiduciaries, like I said, a bank or a trust company or something to handle that kind of estate. It makes real sense. What about co-trustees? You have two kids. What if you name them both? Well, it's good and it's bad because that means they have to sign everything, agree to everything unanimously. Uh, what if they don't get along? I had two sisters named in one estate, ended up suing each other. One managed one building, one managed the other one and the litigation cost probably a million dollars. So you don't want to do that. 
um, you know, oftentimes I have discussions with clients and I say, well, do your kids get along? Oh yeah, they're great. They get along really well. And 20 minutes later, they'll tell me, well, my daughter hasn't talked to my son for 10 years. Well, that's not a good sign to name one of them as the trustee. Um, I, I, I mentioned this, if you're married, should you leave everything to your surviving spouse? Is that a good idea? It depends. And so think about that when you're looking at that diagram. If you have a disabled child, that's a different kind of planning. Maybe that child is on SSI, Medi-Cal, um, and you want to protect the government benefits. We call that a special needs trust, and I do a lot of that planning. I have a lot of clients who have children who have uh, special needs. I have other clients who have mentally ill children, and maybe they're not on SSI and Medi-Cal, but we have to protect that money, otherwise they'd blow it all in the first day. Or a child who is financially irresponsible. You don't want to just hand over a percentage of your estate. So you really have to worry about those kind of situations. And you have to ask the questions. If you're going to an attorney, and the attorney just says, okay, outright to your three kids. That's not good. They should be asking you questions about each one of your children or your nieces and nephews or whomever you're leaving your money to. What about personal property? Some of the biggest fights I see is over mom's dishes or um, the gun collection or you know something that's in the house, a rug. And it doesn't necessarily have to be valuable. It could be just for sentimental reasons. I would say that my daughter-in-law uh, had a grandmother who was 102 when she died. And all my, grand, my, my daughter-in-law wanted was her cookie jar because that brought back some important memories to her. So if I were you, I'd have a list of the important assets, the important items, say this jewelry, I want this necklace to go to this one, this, this uh, uh, you know, my diamond ring to go to that one. It solves a lot of problems. And talk to your children or daughters-in-law or grandchildren or whomever who wants what. And I'll, I think you'll be surprised that many of them don't want anything from you. So don't be surprised. Okay. What about your pets? Do you want to provide for your pets? Remember Leona Helmsley that left $12 million for her dog trouble? Uh, the court, by the way, cut that back to $2 million. But you can have a pet trust where it says, I want to leave whatever amount of money for the care of my pets, the, my horse, my dog, my cat. I want this person in charge of it. I want this person to be the caretaker. Um, usually people don't do that. They usually leave like $10,000 for the care of my cat or my dog or whatever, trusting the person they're leaving it to. But realistically, what if that person just took the $10,000 and gave away the cat or the dog? So think about who you're doing this with, who you're uh, leaving your animals with. What about business interests? Maybe you own a business. Maybe one of your children works in the business and the others don't. So you want to be fair to your children? Well, think about that, how to evaluate it. Um, what is fair? What about special properties? Maybe you have a cabin, maybe you have a ranch. Um, Maybe you have a, a condo in Hawaii. Maybe some of your children use it and some of your children don't use it. How do you make this fair? Should you provide for other people besides your children? Other relatives who could use it? Other friends? Grandchildren? I'm a big proponent of giving to grandchildren because I figure, honestly, by the time I die, my grandchildren are going to be in their 20s and 30s. They'll probably need it more than my children. The old fashioned way of doing things, you leave it to your, your children and when they die, they leave it to their children. Well, guess what? Everybody's living longer. And if you die at 90, let's say, and your children die at 90, it's going to be a heck of a long time until the grandchildren would receive that money. So plan that way. Um, and I'm talking about maybe giving some money during lifetime to people who really need it. I have uh, one guy. I, I I love him. He's a great guy. And um, he decided that in his trust, he gave like $10,000 so this guy could go and play golf in Scotland. I have somebody else who left $10,000 or $20,000 for a party after she died. So think about 
who could use the money and maybe just for fun. They could go on a cruise or whatever they wouldn't normally do. But think of the thrill they would get if they were mentioned in your trust. Maybe you have a significant other or a second spouse. Maybe you bought a house together or maybe that second spouse is living in your house or you're living in that person's house. Do you have an agreement? What if you die first? What if he dies first or she dies first? What kind of agreement? What kind of arrangements? You don't want to be booted out of that house the day of the funeral. So make sure you have some kind of agreement. The same thing if you have to go in a nursing home and, and the house, you know, who's going to pay what, when? So you should discuss this. One of the major topics I hear is should your estate be equally divided among your children or among your nieces and nephews? It's very possible that one is wealthier than the others. It's very possible that you are closer to one than the others. Maybe they've helped you later in life and taken care of you. Maybe one of them you haven't talked to in 10 years. So how do you get around this? Um, and this is a topic of discussion, which is really tough. I sent out an article recently about the aftermath of people not giving equally. And it can be, it can really cause a lot of tension um, in the family if, if you don't give equally. But on the other hand, maybe you don't want to. Another topic that comes up often is if you, let's say you gave your, let's, let's go backwards. If you loaned money or gifted money to a child or a niece and nephew or whomever a friend, was it a loan or was it a gift? So if you help somebody buy a house, let's say, and you put down $100,000 on the house, is it a loan? Is it a gift? So maybe one of the other children is actually the trustee of your trust. And if it's a loan, they have to go after that loan and collect it. If it's a gift, that's a different story. So be very clear about that. Also, I have many clients who want their distribution, maybe the 100,000 to be considered an advance to the distribution at death. So though that one child would get 100,000 less than the other children, let's say. Always ask the what if question. What if that person dies before I do? Where was that money go? Whether it's $10,000 or a percentage of your estate, where would that money go? Would it go to that person's children? Would it go to your other children? Um, would it go to charity? Be very careful about what if. Um, I had a lady who died a couple years ago who had three children and three equal shares. She did not want anything going to the grandchildren if one of them should die. Um, she ended up having dementia and she did not even know that her two sons both died in their 50s from uh, brain cancer, some kind of cancer. And her daughter ended up with like $3 million and the children of the two sons ended up with nothing. So you really need to think about that. What about charities? Now I mentioned I'm very involved with the library. I give money to the library foundation. I help, I put in a, a bench there that says the Allen and Nancy Specter and Family Trust, uh, I'm sorry, Inspector Family gave the bench or an alcove, but there's simple things you can do. You can give a brick. Like I had my staff each um, uh, name a brick. I paid for it because I wanted to at the downtown library. So think about ways how you can make a difference during your lifetime and at death. I have to tell you, I get a thrill every time I see the downtown library because I had a part in it. I get a thrill when I walk past the, um, the playground at 6th and Upis because my husband and I, um, sponsored an enhancement of the playground there along with other people generously also contributed and organizations but when i see those children playing in that playground it gives me a thrill so think about what you can do not just for the library foundation for other charities that are important to you what you can do during lifetime what you can afford to do and what you can do at death and it warms my heart every time i am involved with something that's going on while I'm alive. Once you have a trust, make sure it's funded. I know that sounds ridiculous. I met with this guy the other day who had, a, you know, like eight or nine properties. Not one of them was titled in the name of the trust. Well, there would have been a big probate. I would have made a lot of money. So you got to make sure 
that the trust is funded with your major assets, all those that are not uh, beneficiary, do not have beneficiary designations. You don't need a tax ID number while you're alive. When the trust becomes irrevocable, that's when you have to get a tax ID number or your successor trustee would. Okay, now let's talk about a will. The most common question is, why do I have a will if I have a trust? Okay, good question. So a lot of times people do not put their regular checking accounts into their trust. You don't need to because you can have up to that $166,000 number. Well, um, this a will would mop that up, would actually transfer. It's called a like a pour over will, like you pour over into a, a with a pitcher. That's what it's called, a pour over will. It pours over to your trust. And so we, like I said, we mop it up when somebody dies. We also name a, an executor and we name an, a guardian if you have minor children. Some people really get caught up on that. Like who's gonna raise my children? Who could possibly raise my children as well as I can raise them? Well, it's very, very, very rare that both parents die before the children are 18. So just get your estate planning documents done and you can always change them. Some people in their wills put their burial and cremation directions. Maybe you don't have enough to warrant a trust. So maybe you just have what we call a simple will. And you say, okay, at my death, I want this to go to, you know, these, my estate to go to my spouse. And if my spouse isn't alive, then to my children. Or maybe you have um, most of your assets with retirement in retirement accounts. So you don't have very much. You don't own a home. You don't have a lot in, in bank accounts or investments. Just do a simple will. You don't, everybody doesn't need a trust. If you have a very small, by the way, a, a regular will has to be witnessed in California by two non-interested beneficiaries, meaning you can't have your kids um, be the witnesses. If you have a really small estate, you can handwrite it. It's called a holographic will. It, it is valid. And I don't usually recommend it because most of my clients, to be honest, have more than $166,000. But in some cases it works and you just have to write it all in your own handwriting, not type it. And it does not have to be witnessed. It does not have to be notarized, which is our common questions. Okay, let's go to the durable power as a journey for financial matters. Very important. If you become incapacitated and you have a pension, you are on social security, you have retirement accounts, those, those are not in your trust. So somebody has to be able to stand up for, your, for you if you can't do it yourself. You had a stroke, you had dementia, whatever the reason is, and you name somebody. But again, you have to really trust that person. And you should always name an alternate agent as well as the primary agent. And if you're expecting an inheritance or you get in the middle of a divorce or you have a business interest, you could have a separate, prop, separate paragraphs about those so that it's covered in your power of attorney. Just as also as this, and that one has to be notarized because you're dealing with property. As a side note to this too, is that banks often require their own forms for a power of attorney. So you go to Bank of America or Wells Fargo and you wanna put your, your daughter, your son, your niece, your nephew, somebody as an agent on a power of attorney, get their form because then they won't question it. Okay, now the next topic is the advanced healthcare director. Everybody should have one. I don't care what age, whatever. And this is, um, important because if you can't make your own med medical decisions, who should they make them and what should they follow? You're going to, in this document, you're going to say, yes, prolong my life as long as possible. No, don't prolong my life as long as possible. Um, I want to be buried at such and such a place. I want to donate my organs. I want, um, what about nutrition and hydration? What about if I'm in great pain? You can say whatever you want to. Um, and this one has to be notarized or witnessed and always give a copy to your doctors or to your healthcare providers, Sharp or, or Scripps or wherever you are um, with, a, with one of the healthcare providers. And I would probably give that document to your agent, whoever your agent is as well, a copy. And, and the healthcare providers are just gonna scan it into your, your medical records. This one and your power of attorney should be updated every three to five years. 
So don't be like some of my clients that wait 20 years to come back to me. My, one of my favorite topics is beneficiary designations. That is probably the biggest mistake I see when people die. Why? Because they've named their ex-wife or they've named their mother who's been dead for 20 years or they don't have anybody uh, as a beneficiary designation. This is really important. So um, always check who you should have a primary and you should have a contingent beneficiary. And so do that. And people, people say to me, well, if I name somebody, Nancy is the primary beneficiary and Nancy dies before me, I'll change it. But what if you're incapacitated at that time? So make sure you have both a primary and a contingent beneficiary. And you must provide the financial institution, whether it's a bank or Fidelity or Schwab or wherever it is, with a copy of your change of beneficiary form. It does no good for you to fill it out and have it on your desk. I had that happen to somebody. Never got it in and the person died and the financial institution would not accept it. Consider charities as the beneficiaries on IRAs or 401ks. That is a great way to give to charities. Remember, they don't pay any tax. People pay tax. So with the new law as of last year, if you designate your children, for instance, they have to take it out over a 10 year period. It used to be that they could stretch it out over their whole lifetime, not the case anymore. So over a 10 year, if you leave a million dollars, like I have a couple of my clients, and they have two kids, each one is going to have $500,000 out of that. They're going to have to pay the tax uh, at their rate on that $500,000, either over the 10-year period or at the end of the 10-year period. The exceptions are a spouse, a disabled child, and a few other exceptions. But basically, that's it. you got to pay the tax. If you leave part of it to charity, isn't that wonderful? The charities get the benefit of 100% of it. And I'm not saying leave all of it to the charity, but maybe a percentage, maybe having an IRA that's just for charitable giving. And why we're on that subject, if you are 70 and a half, you can give during your lifetime, your part of your RMD or the required minimum distribution, let's say you have to take out $10,000 a year because you're over 70 and a half or the new law says you're 72, you can transfer the, uh, the required minimum distribution directly to a charity. And that's beautiful because you're donating during lifetime. You're not paying tax that you take out of the, as part of the RMD, required minimum distribution. The charity benefits the full amount. Well, how wonderful. All you have to do is call up your financial advisor and tell them. Other issues that pop up and are red flags to me, joint tenancy. The joint tenancy is an issue a lot of people put their bank accounts or whatever in joint tenancy with their child because they think, well, if I have to go to the hospital, this child can write checks for, for my, you know, my credit card bills or something. Well, guess what? When you die, the whole joint tenancy account will go to that one child. Is that what you want? Or did you want your children to get the, um, your estate equally? I've had people who um, have $300,000 in a bank account in joint tenancy. And I don't think the intent ever was to let that one child have 300,000 more than the other children. Another um, issue that comes up, do you have old documents just sitting around? Should they be shredded? Just keep your latest documents so nobody thinks the old documents are your latest ones. I recommend a use of document locator, which lists who your professionals are, the you, your beneficiaries, their names, addresses, whatever, phone numbers, the location of your assets, um, writing down your passwords and your usernames, and telling somebody where that list is. Where is the document locator? And you should update this on a regular basis. One last topic I would consider maybe you should prepay and prearrange your funeral arrangements. This will help your children or your loved ones, whoever it is, make it simple because you know that people are stressed out when there's a death and in the funeral homes or somebody else could take advantage of the, of your loved ones. And we don't want that to happen. So on that happy note, Kimberly, would you like to take over? Thank you for all this valuable information, Nancy. Uh, that was very informative. 
<laughs> I'd, <laughs> I'd like to turn now to our guest questions. Natalie Gans has been monitoring the chat. Natalie is the Library Foundation's Chief Strategy and Engagement Officer, and she has over 10 years of plan giving expertise. We have a strong team and are a trusted resource for plan giving. Natalie, would you like to join us? Hi, Kimberly. Hi, Nancy. Nancy, thank you so much. Um, I know I've known you and expected you for so long, and I've always loved hearing your, your presentations, and I always learn something. Uh, we have several really cool questions um, that are in the chat, and I even had people um, send me some questions before, before the program. So we'll get started. The first question is, if I already have a trust, how will I modify my current document and will it cost a lot of money? I'm sorry, I, you got cut off a little bit, Natalie. Sure. If you, have a trust, if you have a trust, what? If I have a trust, how will I modify my current document and will it cost a lot of money? Well. If somebody, I, I, people call me all the time about updating their documents, reviewing it. I tell them to send me a copy of the trust uh, ahead of time so I can see what issues I see because maybe it hasn't been 20 years and the tax laws have changed. So I bill hourly. I don't know how other attorneys do it. Um, does it cost a lot of money? Well, you know, there's some people that charge $150 an hour and I charge more. But I know what I'm looking for, and I do it faster. What can I say? <laughs> right. So our next question is, what is your advice to a single person with no family or close friend to serve as the executor of a will or to ensure you are properly cared for if you become incapacitated or suffer dementia? Are there things that do kind of work? And if so, how does one find, a, find them? What are they listed as? What sort of fees do they charge? Those I, I touched on that about professional fiduciaries. I think they're they're a, they're a very valuable part of the society, um, and it's become more popular because people don't necessarily have the right um, individuals in their family to be the successor trustee or the executor or in the and the agent under the power of attorney. So, um, like I mentioned, these have to be licensed, um, and um, they're very, on the whole, they're very good, and they know how to be executors and trustees. Some of them charge a percentage. I think of the estate each year, some of them charge by the hour. You really should communicate and find out. I think it's important to get somebody who's local and that has experience. Yeah, great advice. Um, what are the one most different and two most challenging legal obstacles you have encountered with the planning? You know, I'm having problems. You're getting cut off at times. So what are the challenging what? The most frequent and most challenging legal obstacles you have encountered. The most challenging and legal options? Obstacles. Legal obstacles that's the problems with families who are dysfunctional and co-trustees who don't get along um a trustee who should never have been named to begin with it's a wrong person to name as trustee and the other children maybe maybe one let's say the daughter is taking care of mom and the daughter lives in the house with mom takes care of her for 10 years or something and then mom dies and the daughter who's the name trustee uh, won't leave the house and she's the trustee and so they have to sometimes have a legal action against her as trustee for breaching the trust because all three of them are supposed to get the house and and you know have the trust assets and all that so that's what I see I see more dysfunctional families so when people come to me and say yeah I have really good kids and I could name any one of them and I say oh bless you because it doesn't happen that often anymore I'm I'm I think it's wonderful, but it doesn't happen. I mean, people have issues. Their children have issues. And like I mentioned about mental illness, I mentioned about some people who are just financially not responsible or a disabled child in some way. Um, so you really have to consider 
who is the right person to do the job? Will it work? I think I think that's what I look at. Will this estate plan work? And the reason I don't think I've ever had to go to court on my own documents to say because it didn't work, but I have gone to court on other people's where there's an ambiguity, where the where there's a problem, um, and so we go to court on those issues. Um, but I always think through, just like I said, what if? What if that person dies? What if that happens? You have to think through as much as you can, sort of like playing chess or something going ahead, where you're saying, what is the next step? And you should review it every couple of years. I'm very, I emphasize that a lot, like review your documents, go over them and update the, at least the healthcare and the, and the uh, power of attorney within five years, I would suggest, especially if you get, if you're getting older, obviously we're all getting older. So you can tell by my green hair. <laughs> Me too now too. Okay. Um, can you clarify between irrevocable and revocable? Most trusts in California are revocable trusts, or you could say revocable. It's, people say it either way. That means you can change it anytime you want. And that's a good thing. You can change it anytime you want. So whatever your provisions this year, maybe you didn't get along with your daughter and two years later, you say, you know, now we're on good terms and I want to leave her money. Okay, whatever. You can change whatever you want. Irrevocable means that you cannot change it. All right. So after both deaths, if you're married, after both deaths, you can't change it. If you have a, an estate plan, a trust where the uh, everything goes to the surviving spouse, that surviving spouse could change it all. And that's the risk you take too, like I mentioned, especially in second marriages, third marriages, fifth marriages, whatever. Um, people set up irrevocable trusts. The most common ones are charitable remainder trusts where people leave money to charities like the Library Foundation, for instance, um, or it could be an insurance trust. Um, we call that an islet, um, an irrevocable life insurance trust. Those are probably the most common types of irrevocable trust, but you can't give money outright to minors irrevocably. It doesn't happen that often. Right. Mostly, mostly it's because of death that the trust becomes irrevocable. Right. Uh, why would someone who is younger need an estate plan? Would somebody what? When someone who is younger, why would they need an estate plan? I admit I'm missing the middle of it. When's a younger person? Oh, a younger person. I'm sorry. Yeah. A younger person. Uh, it depends. If they have no money, why would they need it? You know, they. I would have them um, have a power of attorney for financial matters, as well as the health care directive and a simple will. Um, the, um, at least that. They could handwrite it. Like I said, you could handwrite a will called a holographic holographic will if they don't have very much. I have people asking me those questions fairly often because they know that when the parents die, the children will have assets, they will inherit. But until the parents die, the, the child might not have very much in the way of assets. So maybe a simple will would be the answer, maybe a holographic will, but have a power of attorney and a healthcare directive. Right. You mentioned some of this, but I'll get the question for you. What about documents should I share with my loved ones in advance? Should I give copies once I've signed? You know, that's a really good question. I want to tell you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, the, um, I am not a fan of giving copies of documents to your children. I just am not because maybe they don't agree with what you've done. And then if you change your mind in two years or five years or whatever, you have to go collecting all those, all those copies. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's a good idea. Um, should you discuss it with your uh, children? I think the, the general concepts of who is going to be a takeover if you become incompetent um, or at the time of your death, I think it is a good idea. I have clients discuss it with their children sometime and say, who do you think the right person is to be the um, successor trustee? Do you think if you both name, both children are named, can they get along? I do think you should discuss those issues 
Um, but if you leave money to somebody other than your children, maybe they won't like that. You know, you leave it to your friends or your, or your nieces and nephews or to certain charities. They said, well, why aren't you leaving it all to us? And so um, I always say to my clients, it's your estate plan, nobody else's. So do what you want. Right. Um, what happens if I move out of state after I've completed my plan? What happens to if my plan is already complete and then I move to the state? What happens? You move to another state after the, after that. Um, you should definitely consult with an estate planning attorney in that other state. Okay, you. Um, if you're if you're in California, you're fine. Doesn't matter where you live in California, because the law is going to be the same. By the way, I didn't mention this, but I probably should have. Is that California does not have an estate tax? It hasn't had it in 40 years or something. Whereas other states do. So maybe they have a million dollar. If you go over a million dollars, you have to pay an estate tax, a state estate tax, as well as the federal. If you go over 11 million, 700,000. Um, but California, we don't have that. But I recommend that anybody, I've had a lot of clients who have moved to Idaho or to uh, the state of Washington or Wyoming or something during this pandemic. And I tell them, you need to have somebody review it. Some of those states are not community property states. You need to have a healthcare directive and a, a power of attorney, particularly for that state. So nobody has to send it to their legal department. Um, I definitely advise people who move out of state to see a local experienced estate planning attorney. Very good. And this will be our last question so we can stay on time. And the question is, should different people be selected as trustee for your power and health care decisions, or is it best to have them be the same person? Oftentimes the person who handles the finances is not the same person that should be named in as far as the healthcare directive agent, the agent under the healthcare. Maybe your daughter is great at finances, but your son's a doctor and you want to name him or, or your son is a nurse or something so that you want to make sure that the person is the right person for the job who will do the best job as successor trustee, um, agent under the financial power of attorney as executor. Usually that person is the same person. Um, and the healthcare one could be a totally different person. Does that help? It does help. And I just got um, a message from my team that we have time for another question. So I will um, um, ask you one, which is, um, if someone names you as trustee, can you hire small fiduciaries to guide you through the process? If you're named as trustee, you should get help. That's the way I look at it. Whether it's a property manager for some buildings, whether it's an accountant, whether it's a, an attorney, get help. And it, the money will come out of the estate, the trust estate. You don't have to, people ask me, do I have to pay for this personally? No. It comes right off the top, all the expenses, and then the beneficiaries get their get their distributions. So if you are named as trustee, you should get help and you should see the attorney and you don't have to necessarily go to the attorney who drafted the documents. If somebody didn't like me or didn't like Mr. Jones or whoever drafted it, they can go to another attorney, it's up to you. As trustee, you retain the services of an estate planning or probate attorney. You make that decision. Okay, great. And we will um, take another question, which is, does, just a reminder on requirements for the holographic will, will, does it need to be notarized for this? No, and it shouldn't be. A holographic will, when I, it's interesting you're asking because when I went to law school, um, there was a big case that came down that somebody wrote, hand wrote it on a Hilton Hilton hotel stationery. 
And so they said, well, that wasn't 100% in their own handwriting because it said the stationery said the Hilton Hotel. So the law did change to say the the um, most of the of the document has to be in their own handwriting. It does not have to be witnessed. It does not have to be notarized. It just has to be signed and dated. Right. Simple, simple, simple. But make sure you keep the original. Yes. Yes. And what happens if I own property in multiple states? If you own property in multiple states, you can pull it all into your trust. And that's one of the great advantages of a trust. I have many clients who have property in Ohio because that's where they used to live or they live or they have a place in Hawaii or they have a, a Colorado, they have a place in Colorado, a resort place. Well, guess what? You can pull them all into your trust and you don't have to have a probate in each one of those states when you die. So that's that's a real that thank you for asking that question. That's an important question. But like I only help people who are clients. My clients are all residents of California. I'm not if they move end up moving to Colorado, I say just your former question, you need to see an attorney there. Right. Well, Nancy, thank you so much. Um, we're going to call you Kimberly. Hello. She Kimberly. Is. Hello. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Natalie. And thank you to our guests for all your meaningful questions. If you didn't get your question answered, please feel free to contact Nancy or me. Our contact information will be up on the screen shortly. We'll email it to you as well. Nancy, would you like to share some closing comments? Actually, I would. So since you asked, um, we don't know what's going to happen with the future tax laws. We really don't know. Um, we have a new president. Uh, what will Congress do as far as the estate tax exemption goes? Yeah, I told you it was 11700000 It's supposed to sunset in 2025. What will happen next year? What will happen in the year as afterwards? What's going to happen with what we call the step up in basis or the standard deduction? We really don't know what's going to happen in the future. So keep your eyes on the prize, as they say and read the newspaper, listen to the news about estate tax issues and your general tax issues. Um, I have to tell you, my license plate on my car says plan ahead. So that's my best advice I can give you, plan ahead. Be organized, plan ahead. Make it easier for your loved ones by taking care of these issues now. Update your documents and it will give you peace of mind and um, and your family, your loved ones, whoever it is, it will give them peace of mind. And good luck with any of this. And contact me, contact me if you have questions. It's been a pleasure. I want to thank our wonderful speaker, Nancy Spector. We deeply appreciate how generous you've been with your time and expertise, Nancy. And to our guests, I'm so grateful to you. I hope our conversation has been beneficial to you. Please be on the lookout in our emails and e-newsletters for future estate planning webinars and other talks throughout the year. If you'd like more information on plan giving, please contact me as well as your professional advisors. I hope our paths cross soon, again, in person at the library. Thank you for joining us.